Hello, and welcome to this State Street Digital podcast. I'm James Redgrave, Head of Thought Leadership and Editorial for State Street Digital, and I'm joined today by a couple of my regular guests, Nitin Gore, Head of Technology and Asset Design for State Street Digital, and Michael Metcalf, Head of Macro Strategy for State Street Global Markets. Nitin, Michael, thanks for joining me. Pleasure. Thanks, James. Glad to be here. So your articles in this quarter's digest both touch in different ways on the potential or otherwise for an increase in cryptocurrency utility. Nitin, in your article, one of your predictions for the coming year is that the universe of cryptocurrency investors who buy the assets for useful purposes rather than the expectation of purely momentum-based returns will expand. Which uses do you see growing the most in the short to medium term? Well, that article that I wrote came actually from a lot of reflections that we did post FTX world when things were still blowing up in the crypto world and looking into what is the utility of crypto in general. So there's entire narrative that the industry went with in talking about using crypto as more of a utility asset than a purely speculative asset. And that context, uh, Bitcoin as an asset representation of the of the entire industry in general, looked into what is the role of Bitcoin you know, in the ecosystem. Of course, we've, we've viewed Bitcoin as inflation hedge. We've looked at Bitcoin as a payment instrument. We looked at Bitcoin as investment instruments. And if you look at the fundamental thesis of Bitcoin, it's essentially a trust currency in the sense that it provides an avenue into immutable ledger that not only ascertains property rights, but also provides a, I would say, a global transaction framework that enables low cost and easy transfer value. But over time, that definition has been distorted. And some of the technical tenants like immutability and transparency and consensus, which is technical terms, essentially lends itself to the trust system that we're talking about here. So there's a store of value narrative. There's a transaction system that provides mean of exchange narrative. And being the liquid crypto asset, which is, again, a representation of asset class of the crypto asset itself, is unit of account narrative. And so looking at that stuff, we went back to some of the innovation that's happening in the industry. Again, what we have seen this year is Bitcoin encryption as a innovation narrative where NFTs and DeFi conversation are back into the Bitcoin sort of context. And that is one of the sort of, you know, uh, assertions I made in the article is focusing on utility because utility drives value. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. And I, th- I think we actually capture some of that when we look at the kind of entities that were buying Bitcoin at the end of the year, you know, kind of on-chain climate. And so, you know, using data from Glassnode, we look at the characteristics of the entities that we're buying, and in particular, and it was very clear around year end when, you know, obviously, we, you know, all remember we were in the sort of the, the depth of the crypto winter, and you know, you were concerned about systemic issues in crypto, not in traditional finance, obviously, which I guess it will come on to at some point. But at the height of the kind of the bearish, is actually the investors that were buying uh, were typically the investors that were buy and hold. In other words, in- investors that the entities that typically accumulate Bitcoin over time in their wallets and don't sell. And that proportion of, of Bitcoin holdings that are held by that kind of investor, you know, I think is at a five-year high. So you know, I, I think it, the activity that we see on chain supports exactly what you're saying, that the people that are coming in, or the, the, maybe investor isn't the right term, but the people that are buying Bitcoin right now uh, you know, are the ones that are here for the long term, not some sort of short-term speculative gain or momentum trading, as you say. Thanks a lot, both of you. So one potential use of crypto that's frequently cited and that Nitin, you did mention, is is as an inflation hedge. Uh, Michael, your piece suggests that in the case of Bitcoin, at least, um, it hasn't performed that function over the last year when there has been sort of unusually high inflation. Was it ever a realistic expectation that it would? Look, I think that there are clearly elements to it, uh, in particular, the the finite supply. Look, obviously, it, it's a liquid tradable asset as well that's in finite supply. So it does have some of the conditions. I think the challenge, though, and, and one of the things that we're able to do thanks to our affiliation with Price Stats, which measures uh, inflation using prices that are scraped off the internet, so we have a daily measure of inflation you know, thanks to that collaboration, uh, we can look very precisely at what kind of assets serve as an inflation hedge uh, and those that don't. And here, I should just stress that when I'm talking about inflation hedge, uh, I'm talking about inflation as defined in the economic circles of uh, you know the annual rise in the price level of consumer goods. Uh, I'm not talking about you know this is, I think there's sometimes a, a a slight confusion of terms here because obviously Bitcoin's inflation rate often refers to the rate at which the supply of Bitcoin is going up, which of course that is controlled. But you know I think unfortunately when we dig into it empirically, you know what we don't see is a particularly robust correlation between movements in Bitcoin prices and actually movements in inflation. Uh, and then of course you know over the last year in particular. 
at various points when look inflation obviously is still a challenge right now but it was it was more of a challenge at points last year uh, and during those periods uh, you know bitcoin didn't prove to be a particularly good inflation hedge so i think certainly the case empirically uh, is quite hard to make uh, that bitcoin can protect purchasing power relative to the rise in consumer prices thanks anything to add on that nathan yeah, yeah, no, absolutely. And I think, you know, if you look at all the things that Michael mentioned, which is fixed supply, price stability, and eventually the store of value investment theory, which is the performance of Bitcoin over the last decade in general, serves as a further evidence that we have been looking at uh, as the hedge against the currency devaluation and strengthen its store of value investment theory. But if you look at the transition that we had in the past few months, which is, I think, what you know, Michael was talking about, is that in the zero you know, interest rate environment, we shifted from a risk-free interest to interest-free risk. And now we are sort of dialing back in terms of, you know, and this 200 economic dilemma or economist dilemma, which is, do we have enough uh, sort of monetary supply that that helps, you know, strengthen the economy or versus sort of preserving the value of the, or, or the purchasing power of the, you know, of the assets. That's where things are. I think Bitcoin in general has stood the test of time in that, in that respect, I think. James, let me just jump back in there because I do think, and you alluded to this, is obviously the the time frame here is is important, and that you know there are yeah. certainly you depending on when you you start your analysis, there are definitely periods you can see where obviously you know Bitcoin delivered returns that were well above inflation and significantly above inflation, and therefore did protect you in those periods. Um, but but obviously it, it's very dependent on the timing. But you know obviously if you go back far enough, then then yes, you know, the nominal returns of Bitcoin have been far higher than inflation. So, so obviously, from that point of view, you could say that uh, that Bitcoin has served as an inflation hedge over certain periods of time. I think what we're looking at is just in terms of the shorter term correlations, and actually, well, looking at the kind of direct causation and the correlation of the link between Bitcoin and inflation. That's the case, which I think is is currently still harder to make. That's great. Thank you both. So let's assume that um, some of these utility cases for crypto that, that Nitin's described earlier sort of come to pass, as it were, and there becomes a, a wider range or spectrum of investor types interested in Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. How does that affect the performance and the characteristics of these asset classes in the variety of different economic conditions that they'll face over a, a long holding cycle? I'll, I'll give it a shot and then, Michael, you can opine on this. Uh, so a few things in this slide. The reason why we're focusing on utility, so there's two elements that I'm at least at a technical standpoint, the industry is focused on scalability and usability. So scalability reduces transaction cost, truly goes towards a global footprint of those transaction systems, and usability leads to many of the, the utility itself, which is people using Bitcoin for, for day-to-day stuff, which the entire payment narrative has completely gone amiss in the last, I would say, decade per se, which was the genesis of Bitcoin is ability for me to be able to move value across the world at the cheapest possible rate, which again has come up in the in the payment context. So scalability and usability has been some of the elements. Now, this year, Bitcoin went to looking at NFTs, which was really preserved for the non-Bitcoin sort of ecosystems, such as Ethereum and Solana's of the world, and looking into DeFi, which is decentralized finance. Uh, so if you look into the financial system that's being built on this crypto infrastructures in general, the access is universal. So if you had an Ether or Bitcoin anywhere in the world, the access to the financial system, which is the DeFi protocols, is the same no matter where you're from, which is not the case for the existing financial system in general. And that drives, in a lot of cases, the utility, which is ability for, for any individual or any institution for anywhere in the world to be able to understand both in terms of the fixed supply of, of these assets. So the demand of this driven by the utility goes up and there's only fixed supply of Bitcoin itself, whether you're paying Bitcoin as a tolling mechanism or keeping Bitcoin as a inflation hedge. I think there are two drivers that you know need to be understood because no one can really change the supply of Bitcoin in general today, right? And that's that's not true for all crypto assets, but that's generally true for most crypto assets because that thrives upon this whole element of the fact that the supply is immutable and it's the economics of the system that drives the valuation of these assets and utility drives the demand. And that is sort of the, the linkages between the utility, as opposed to the speculation that we've seen in the, the latter part of 2022, which caused the issues in the market. Yeah, I mean, it's fascinating when you say it's, and it's something that we're looking at you know, all the time, really, is you know, what is the interaction of crypto, but Bitcoin in particular, with traditional assets, and how will it fit in? Uh, you know, I suppose is another way to kind of just reform the question. And you know, I, I think look, it, it it's still incredibly early days to know exactly how it will fit in. However, just a couple of observations from 
uh, some of the flow data that we see, which is that you know throughout um, 21 and 22, uh, it seemed pretty clear that the net inflows into Bitcoin uh, as captured by uh, you know, weekly changes in realized market cap, which is an, an okay proxy for the kind of net capital that's flowing in. It seemed to us that actually the net flows into Bitcoin, rather than being uncorrelated with flows into traditional assets, were actually quite correlated. So on the one hand, it was probably quite a good thing uh, because it showed that Bitcoin was beginning to gain acceptance. But what it meant, and I think you alluded this before, Nitin, is that it meant that in the the big liquidity wave, which hit all markets in 21, Bitcoin you know, really got a benefit from that, uh, like everything, a rising tide lifts all boats. And then, of course, when the tide came out very rapidly in 22, Bitcoin then got hit uh, at a time when I think that there was you know, maybe on the idea that it was a diversifier, uh, you know, or that it was an inflation hedge, it just got hit at the wrong time because actually it had been a liquidity play uh, in 21. So I think that'll be an interesting thing to, to monitor going forward as, you know, views about liquidity right now, obviously, are swinging weekly. But it would seem to be, I think, you know, in the response that we've had to the recent wobbles in banking, and then obviously the idea that liquidity may come back or at least won't get withdrawn at the same rate, Really interesting to me that Bitcoin's begun to outperform again in that environment where you know liquidity is less challenged. And I think the other thing that's also very clear in terms of just empirics uh, is that that Bitcoin looks to be, and again, it's, it's the inverse of it being a hedge to traditional assets, but you know is increasingly correlated to the tech sector. So you know I think right now if we just look at kind of behavior and empirics uh, in terms of where Bitcoin fits in, it's almost like a liquidity driven tech play. Uh, would be the way that we would describe it from the current empirics. Now, that could change, but I think that's kind of where we are now. Again, very interesting. Thank you both. Before we finish up here, do either of you have anything else you wanted to bring up on this topic? Yeah, I actually want to ask Michael a few things. Michael, I, I actually wrote quite a bit on this topic and I've been discussing in the industrial sort of context the role of stable coins, right? And again, stable coin is a banking on-ramp, off-ramp, which again has come under scrutiny lately for obvious reasons. But one thing that happened during the zero interest rate period there's tremendous liquidity in the space. Smart money is finding way to find avenues to make that investment and find the returns. And stablecoin was a major avenue for liquidity movement from traditional finance into crypto finance. And that has interesting valuation of all crypto assets, not just Bitcoin in general. Bitcoin being the representation of the entire industry, uh, you know, as a general, as a as a barometer. And when we begin to see again during high interest rates um, that liquidity move out uh, of the crypto industry. And few observation is again, you know, when when the liquidity moved out, not only it affected the the immediate price movement of Bitcoin per se, but then you begin to see geopolitical events. This is again the narrative between U.S. versus China, the war in Russia, the the recent ASEAN summit, which sort of proposed use of local currencies only because of the fact that you know high dollar has an impact on commodities markets. Looks into BRICS nations, which is looking into bypassing SWIFT in general. So there's all these narratives happening, which sort of impacts the overall demand around dollar being used as a primary sort of you know asset for commodities trade, for instance. And then you looked into some of the regulatory actions in the US. Uh, some of them have been labeled as Operation Choke Point uh, 2.0, looking into uh, many of the movement of smart cop capital, again, uh, going towards the decentralized exchanges. So suddenly the flight of these sort of capital, which is crypto capital, moving from exchanges to decentralized exchanges. I'm looking at all of this stuff in, in trying to understand the rise of Bitcoin and emergence of Bitcoin ecosystem narrative. Like, what does all this mean for crypto asset? Is it generally having an impact on not just price, but utility of Bitcoin? And I'll say one more thing, and, and which I read in Wall Street Journal about the Zimbabwe, which is notorious for its hyperinflationary trillion dollar notes, has now eventually switched to producer credits. So when you go to a store, people just can't keep up uh, with these notes and they give you their own credit, which is utilized in the store and depending on the reputation of the store, the producer credits are now eventually being exchanged as a medium of exchange you know, in the country. And so you have all these geopolitical events transpiring at the same time. We are having interesting you know, um, moment of, of, of these events. I'd love to see get your thoughts in terms of, is this the same impact that we see in the traditional sort of currency valuation that we see with Bitcoin and crypto assets, if that makes sense? Yeah, it's, yeah it does. It does completely. And look, I think so. I've been analyzing exchange rates for the best part of 30 years. And I, I kind of feel like that from the beginning of my career, we've been asking the same question, 
which okay. is at what point will the dollar's dominance turn? And you know, I I, I do agree with you that that right now, uh, and you know, some of this would have happened, you know, perhaps even without the, some of the wobbles we've seen in in, in the U.S. banking sector recently. Uh, but I think you know, the geopolitics is becoming uh, increasingly fragmented, and it would seem to suggest that the, the dollar's dominance will be challenged. Uh, I think that just I, the only reason I started with that kind of long-term perspective uh, is just that this has been, you know, a long feared uh, event, which you know has yet to happen. Uh, and you know, th these things have an incredible amount of inertia and frequently don't change overnight. But I, I do agree with you that the pressures on and the kind of the narrative around the dollar right now, at least on a medium term view, is is more challenged because, it, but primarily because of the geopolitics. And I think that the the thing that we'll we'll probably watch closely is that it's an interesting data set from the IMF, which looks at how central banks are allocating their dollar reserves, uh, their their global FX reserves. And I think that what you'd look for to support this thesis is a gradual long-term decline in the dollar share adjusted for exchange rate changes, which we have seen some decline, but it's just a question of trying to find an alternative. When the euro came into existence, that was supposed to be the alternative. Uh, and actually, it turned out that, that central banks did not allocate more of their reserves to the euro. Um, uh, and you know, in fact, I think it went down and now it's just recovering. And then, of course, the next question is, would, would it be the renminbi? And, and again, reserves there are rising, but you know, there's still a fraction of where the dollar is. And then finally, to get to your actual question, then the big question then, I suppose, is do stable coins or even uh, you know some sort of central bank backed digital currency, currencies, uh, yeah. yeah, currencies it should be, shouldn't it? Uh, is that a potential you know alternative to you know the single dollar system? Because it we're definitely moving to a multipolar world, uh, and maybe we have been for a while, you know. But that dollar dominance has just been there for so long. I just feel like it's going to be difficult to break, even though uh, you know there are now alternatives emerging. No, oh, that's brilliant. Thank you. Excellent. Well, again, thank you both. This has been a really interesting discussion. So I just want to thank you again, Michael and Nitin. Pleasure. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, James. And thanks to everyone listening. I hope you've enjoyed this and found it a valuable discussion. To read the latest State Street Digital Digest, visit statestreet.com. And I hope you can join me again for future digital podcasts. Thanks very much. Goodbye. Goodbye.